test, test. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we have good news. Without further ado, our technical experts were able to get us up and running. So yeah, exactly, let's give them a round of applause. Yeah, no doubt, thank you so much. Um, but like I was saying, I wanted to go through this. I know we're a little bit behind now, so I'll probably talk just as fast as I normally would, but just slow me down in case you miss something. But really what I wanna do is on the next slide is tell you just a little bit about the agenda and what I wanna do here today. I want to first and foremost tell you a little bit about my background. I think it's important to provide context to tell you who I am and what I'm doing here and how I got this beautiful wheelchair that I used to roll around in, right? So I'll provide you that story. Um, then I'll also talk a little bit more about your self-advocacy, the importance of your personal story how, what you can do to identify not only the problems that you might be facing, but also solutions for them. Then we'll talk about remaining calm when addressing those issues and situations. And then finally, building a coalition and being patient to persevere. So we're gonna talk through all of those things. We'll even have an opportunity to maybe share with one another or brainstorm a little bit of how you could be your own best advocate. Um, one thing I should point out is in this slide, I told Mike I'd do my best to do image descriptions as much as possible. Mike, you're missing a good one with this picture. So I'm in the, I'm in the foreground um, with a, a puzzled look on my face and in the background is actually Representative Steve King and Senator Chuck Grassley um, getting a chuckle together. And the reason that I say this is important to kick off this slideshow is because you need to remain calm. Sometimes you're gonna be in a room with individuals that you might not agree with everything on. And sometimes you need them to be in your corner. And so you have to be able to remain calm and talk about solutions in order to move forward. So next slide. As we said in my bio, um, here's a picture of me um, actually wearing a, a nice suit for a graduation announcement. I'm on a golf course actually holding my golf club. I was hoping, I had dreams and aspirations of actually being a golf pro. Um, so I was going to be going to Morningside University on a golf scholarship and was really excited about that prospect of college. I was looking forward to that. I'm a pretty outgoing individual, if you can't tell. So I loved the opportunity to meet people and just really the, the thought of going on to that next step was really exciting for me. So next slide. This is actually a photo of a friend of mine that I got to meet during that first year, a first couple of weeks rather. His name is Dave Keenan. He now lives in Des Moines. Um, we're there kind of uh, proud of ourselves. We had just won a duct tape uh, trophy as well as a duct tape belt. Because um, who knew duct tape bowling was a thing? It actually is in a dormitory and we won the championship. So we are pretty proud there. Um, but really, I, I was making quick friends, a lot of great people, and just living my best life in college there. In fact, um, one of my favorite stories is I, I met Dave and we had convinced each other there was going to be a freshman dance. So if you think back, whether it's high school or college, there might have been a freshman dance, right? So it's a chance for us to all get to know each other and have that awkward moment where, you know, no one's dancing together. And uh, it was very much so that I convinced Dave and some other friends on the hall that we needed to go do that. And so we went to this dance. And as you can imagine, like I said, the women were where? Out on the dance floor. And the men were where? Exactly. Holding up the wall, making sure that everything was okay. And so what I did was the, the DJ came on the mic and he said, okay, we're going to partner up. Everyone, we're having a dance competition. Now, you might not know this about me, but I'm a dancer. I loved dancing. And so what I did is I spied this woman across the dance floor and I, she had some moves. So what I did is I went over to her, I grabbed her hand, spun her into me, dipped her and said, we're gonna win this competition because I had moves. And so then we just started dancing. They started eliminating couples left and right. And by the end of it, we were the champions. So if you're keeping track, I won two championships just in a matter of weeks at college. I was living my best life for sure. But really we had a great time kind of meeting. I eventually got her name. Her name was actually Danielle. I didn't even know her before we won that championship. But it was really a great time. I actually got to be fast friends with Danielle and a couple of her other friends. Um, and, and I convinced her that I didn't know how to do my own laundry. So she would help me with that. Um, that, was, that was how slick and smooth I am. 
Um, and so I got to hang out with her and some other friends right away. Well, what they told me and convinced me of was that they were going to be going to Okaboji for a family reunion. And she said, oh my gosh, Alex, you have to come up for my family reunion because you're from Okaboji. And so you'll show us around, tell us all about it. It'll be a blast. So we actually go up to Okaboji um, and we get up there. Next slide. This is actually a photo from that night. The girls that were going up there went straight to the resort and Dave and I actually went to my parents' house. So we stopped in to be able to see my parents and say hi. And this was the crew that was at my parents' house. So we actually had um, my godmother, Elvira, um, her daughter, Teddy Ann, and her husband, Wayne. And then my beautiful little sister is right there in the middle. So it's a family shot right there of all of us. So that was that night. We were hanging out and catching up with them just a little bit about what there was going on in their lives before we would meet the girls up at the resort. One thing you might notice about this picture is that Wayne is actually sitting. He's using a, uh, a actual a manual wheelchair. And I remember very vividly that night when we were getting ready to say goodbye to him. He was getting ready to leave and head out to his van. And so I helped wheel him down, wheel him down a ramp in our garage so that he could get in his van. My mom and I are standing at the end of the driveway, and I remember him driving away. And I remember turning to my mom and just saying, how much would that suck to be paralyzed? How much would that suck to have to use a wheelchair? I had no idea what, the rest, what was in store for me the rest of that night. But it was such a moment that, that I remember so clearly. So we ended up leaving. We went up to meet the girls at this family reunion. We did the very traditional family reunion things in Okaboji. As I was saying, I'm a great singer, so I'm sure we were singing things around the campfire. I will spare all of you. There was that uncle playing the, like, ukulele or something over there. We were playing catch with a football. We were doing all of the family reunion things. Um, and then eventually we decided that we wanted to go swimming. It was getting late in the season. It was about midnight at this point in time. So we decided, hey, we're going to go swimming. The girls were going to go in and change into their bathing suits. I'm from Okaboji, so I basically lived in board shorts um, or swim trunks, if you will. And so I was ready to go. I went out with one of the little brothers. We went out on the dock. Next slide. There's actually a photo of the dock right here. So we went out on the dock, and I got about um, 150 feet out on this dock, a long ways out on this dock. And a gust of wind came up, and it knocked my hat off of my head out into the water. Well, knowing that I wanted that hat back, I took off my shirt and I dove in after it. I would find out later that where I dove in was 18 inches deep. It was 18 inches deep, and you can't tell by me sitting here today, but at this time, about, I'm about 6'1". 6'2", and I dove in headfirst into 18 inches of water. I remember hearing my neck snap and having really no idea what that meant. I'd never broken a bone before, and I was just laying there motionless in the water face down. I remember thinking to myself, like, you got to swim. You really got to start swimming. And my body just wouldn't react. I couldn't move. And so eventually, I remember telling myself, you got to start swimming. And I still just couldn't move. And I remember getting really calm, really calm. And slowly, everything went black, and I drifted off. Meanwhile, topside, the little brother that was out on the dock with me, he ran in to get the girls. He thought I was joking at first and then got very scared. So he ran in to get the girls, told them that it was me and that I was face down in the water. They thought he was joking as well until they saw his face, and they saw how scared he was. So they rushed out. Um, uh, Danielle was first out. She ran down um, the dock and jumped in, luckily feet first, and was able to get me flipped over. Brittany would come out later. She would run in and jump in as well. She thought Danielle was sitting on the bottom. Danielle was sitting on the ground holding me up, and Brittany thought she was standing, holding me in the water. That's how deceiving this was. They were able to give me some rescue breaths and get me breathing again. 
Um, once I was breathing, I the next memory that I have is actually they had called an ambulance and paramedics, and they were rushing to my side. They were loading me in the ambulance. And the memory that I have is looking up at one of the paramedics. I actually knew him. His wife taught me piano. See, my dad's uh, Bennett was a police officer almost my entire life, so I knew this paramedic. And I looked up at Mike, and I said, I really messed up. I really messed up. And so then I was taken to the hospital. The next memory that I have is actually um, getting ready to board the helicopter. And so all of a sudden, Mike's wife, Deanne, rushed up to my side. You see, when Mike saw that it was me, he called his wife, my old piano teacher, who's also a paramedic, and said, it's Alex, and it doesn't look very good. You should come here. So I was met by Deanne, who was kind of hysterical. She was crying and telling me, you're going to be okay. You're going to be okay as she's crying. And looking back at it now, it's like, well, if I'm going to be okay, why are you crying? <laughs> right? But she was just trying to be reassuring. And so I would be taken um, actually by life flight. I was getting onto the helicopter and being life flighted down to Sioux City to uh, Mercy Medical Center. And so I was down there. My parents would ultimately meet me there with um, my then pastor. And we said a prayer, one more prayer, and I was whisked off to surgery. Um, I do remember the surgeon. He was walking around my table telling me about the surgery he was going to perform, going in through the front of my neck, the back of my neck, removing a broken vertebrae because I had fractured my C5 and C6 vertebrae in my neck. And so he was talking to me all about this. The memory that stands out the most is I remember hearing his shoes, like, clicking as he was walking around me. And I didn't know what that was. My, my mom can vouch for this. The, the surgeon was wearing actually blue jeans and cowboy boots. I think that's something that still terrifies them to this day. Um, but he was a brilliant surgeon. Um, he was just a little bit odd, I think. And, um, uh, but I was, I was so thankful for him. And so um, next slide. So then I was able to have that surgery. It went well. Um, and then ultimately I would spend a couple weeks um, right there in, in, I would spend a couple, couple weeks there at Mercy Medical Center in Sioux City. Um, Mike, what I, what I have a picture up here is actually me laying in a hospital bed. I have much longer and more fuller hair um, in this photo than I have currently. Um, but yeah, you can see me laying in that hospital bed. I would end up um, deciding, making a choice that I think affected the rest of my life, and that was where I chose to do my rehab, my rehabilitation. And I actually did that out at Craig Hospital in Inglewood, Colorado. It's out by Denver. And so I ended up actually spending six months in rehab. Six months. And the reason for that is because I actually battled pressure ulcers. I really struggled and was plagued with pressure ulcers. And so if those of you that don't know, when you're paralyzed and you can't feel your body, you don't know when you want to shift. Now, these chairs look maybe a little comfortable, but I'm guessing they're not too comfortable. So you have to shift your weight around, right? Well, I can't tell when I need to shift my weight around. And so by the time I made it to Craig Hospital, you could almost see my tailbone. That's how bad the pressure sore had gotten. And so three of those six months were spent on bed rest. I actually had to have multiple surgeries to try to correct these pressure ulcers. Now, Three months in bed rest, I've talked to some students, and they think that might be pretty cool, right? I mean, that's a lot of Netflix right there. That is some time to straight up binge some TV shows. But let me tell you, this is before smartphones. This is Netflix was not a thing, my friends. I was literally going through DVDs of Dawson's Creek and watching the entire seasons. I fell in love with Joey of Dawson's Creek at least a couple of times. Now, some of you might not know what Dawson's Creek was, but let me tell you, yeah, Joey was, she was, uh, she was amazing, and I was just pretending I was Dawson the whole time, but, but it was a long time, and I was blessed to have so much support out at Craig Hospital. My parents actually took turns coming out and spending those six months with me, and so I was really lucky and blessed with that. I actually um, said that this choice to go out to Craig Hospital was life-changing because I met so many incredible people, people that actually devoted their lives, whether it was the nurses, the techs, the doctors, the therapists, to make my life better and to inspire me to want more for myself. And so I really used that motivation to really drive myself and say, I knew that I wanted to make more um, of this life. I wanted to feel like I was giving back and that I was here for a purpose. 
And so at the end of those six months, I knew I was going to be returning home. And I'll tell you, returning home was a little more scary than even just staying out there in Denver. And the reason was, is out in that hospital, everything was accessible, right? Everything was accessible. If I wanted to roll up to the door, you know what it did? It opened up, right? Automatic doors. I wasn't fighting with no door out front, trying to pull it open or mess with the door handle. Or if I was laying in bed and I needed something, there was this cool little button. I would hit that. A nurse would come and ask what I need. I would maybe ask for a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, right? I tried getting my mom to install one of those buttons. Y'all can imagine how that went, okay? I didn't get one of those buttons, so returning home was a little scary. And, I mean, it was scary for a couple reasons, too. I mean, my friend's house, you know, I couldn't get to my friend's house because they had those things in front of their doors. You know what I'm talking about. Stairs. Yeah, exactly. I couldn't get there. So it was a little scary. But next slide, please. I actually made my way back to Morningside University. You see, I had started there right before my accident. I actually got to play in one golf meet of college. And then had my accident. But I knew I wanted to return there because they had been such a great support system to me. Gosh, I even had a group of fraternity brothers that drove out to, to Denver, Colorado to spend some time with me at the hospital. It was awesome. So I knew I wanted to go back. And actually now, um, in this photo, you actually see me. Mike, I'm bundled up, man. It is the middle of winter. And I am bundled up in my wheelchair. And I actually, my buddy has a tow rope connected to the back of me. We're going down a hill, and he is sliding on a cafeteria tray. I kid you not. Now, now I know what you all are thinking, and yes, we did return the cafeteria tray, okay? We made sure to return that to its rightful home, but we had a, I had a blast making these friendships and getting back there um, to Morningside, but it was also a period of change, you know? It was determining what I was going to be able to do. Not only did my body change, but also my major and what I wanted to do. Um, I had to build a support system around me. These fraternity brothers, individuals that were willing to get me out of bed or maybe throw me in bed or even just help me eat a meal. I had so many great people around me. I ended up, um, at next slide, pursuing a degree in political science. I fell in love with that once again. In high school, I was a page in the Iowa House of Representatives. And I loved that. And so I thought, gosh, this is such a cool thing to study. I had no idea what I was going to do for a job, but I figured Morningside would help me out with that. So I ended up graduating four years later with that degree. Um, the economy was horrible in 2009, if any of you remember that. So I decided that I would continue my education. I was lucky enough I went on and received my master's in negotiation and dispute resolution from Creighton University. Around that time, you know, we had wars raging. Um, actually, Iraq, Afghanistan, and I thought we need to do a much better job communicating with one another. That's why I pursued what I did. And so I ended up doing that following, um, and actually, sorry, Mike, there are two graduation photos. One um, with my entire family, my mom, dad, and my little sister um, from my Morningside graduation. I'm wearing the whole cap and gown. Gosh, I look good, man. I wish, yeah, I, you, you should see this smile. And then um, the next one is just my sister and I. So um, I just graduating from Creighton. And so it was, it was really some monuments, um, some milestones that I was really excited um, to, to have achieved. Next slide. As mentioned in my bio, I then went out to do an internship with the American Association for People with Disabilities. And this was really life-changing for me. Um, as you can see in the photo up there, or as is displayed, um, it's actually a whole group of us ranging from people with visual impairments, um, uh, audio impairments, um, or whether they have physical disabilities, all different ranges. And I learned so much from them. You see my roommates when I was out there, we all were placed in very different places, um, but we all housed together. And I had one individual that was visually impaired and one that was completely deaf that was actually um, were my roommates. And I learned so much about accessibility and so much about accommodations from them. It was really moving to me and what it meant to be an advocate. After that, after the graduation from that program where I was actually placed at the US Department of Education, after that program I returned home um, and was really trying to figure out what I wanted to do next with my life. Next slide. Yeah, yeah, well I guess I should have said 
that whole group of individuals um, that are right there were on the steps of the U.S. Capitol is where that photo was taken place out in Washington, D.C. The next photo is of me in my first job. So my first job after going to Washington, D.C. and coming back, it was a big step. It was a scary time. I mean, gosh, we were just talking, weren't we, about that transition into getting a job and how scary that can be because you might lose benefits. And so what we were doing was um, I had to balance that fear and knew that I wanted to take that step. And so I actually joined Organizing for America, Barack Obama's re-election team. And what I ended up doing was being a field organizer, something I was very nervous to do because the two jobs of a field organizer is to knock doors and to make phone calls. The way I saw it, I could only do about half of those jobs, right? But they, end, they ended up saying they wanted to hire me because guess what? They don't need someone that could knock the most doors. They needed someone that could inspire a team of volunteers to knock doors for them. And by the end of that campaign, I'm proud to say my team was knocking more doors than anyone in the state. It was awesome. Following that, um, and actually that, that image description, so I actually have, um, I'm in a parade. A little girl is riding on my lap. I got this sweet bandana on that's red, white, and blue. Um, with a big cheesy smile on my face because the sun is beaming on my face. So I'm like a cat. I love to be in the sun. So we're riding in a parade with beads and everything. Next slide. Following that, I actually um, started working on Morningside in 2014, holding several different positions, some that were mentioned. And now I'm actually the director of alumni engagement, which, ha which has me working with over 12,000 alumni all over the world from Morningside. Here in this photo, I'm actually speaking with one of my students when I was a first year advisor, just trying to pay it forward. Uh, my experience at Morningside was amazing and helped me navigate what I wanted to do with my life. And so I wanted to pay it forward and be able to do that for so many at Morningside. Next slide. This is actually a photo of myself and my other four council members at the NAIA championship with that banner in the background. So I'm standing there with um, my fellow council members. I was appointed to the city council in 2017, elected in November of 17, and then re-elected here in 2021. It's been a wild ride. That gets you updated to about where I am today. It's been a wild ride, but I've learned a lot of different things, and I've learned a lot about self-advocacy, what we all need to do to remain calm, and what we all need to do to maybe advocate, advocate for ourselves or for those in our family, for those that we know, for those that we care about. And some of those lessons are difficult. Some of those things we have to learn or we learn along the way. So what I want to do, next slide please, is I want to share some of those things with all of you. I want to talk about some of those learning objectives. And first, I want to talk about the importance of staying calm. Really in those emotional situations, I want to talk to you about some strategies to do that. Also some strategies, tips, and resources to really positively channeling that emotion when you advocate, and what you can do to make a difference in your world and those around you. And finally, do a little practicing, maybe sharing with one another what you think um, your story is and how you might best advocate. Next slide. This one, what I want to start with is the power of your personal story. So you all have heard my story, but I tell you what, I've told my story over time and time again through different publications or individuals that maybe want to do a story. And so I was thinking to myself, when we advocate, sometimes we're only getting a brief window, aren't we? Gosh, if you're talking to an elected official, how much time do you get? Right? 30 seconds in between meetings? Hi, I'm walking to my next meeting. I'd like you to talk. Yeah, exactly. Can we walk and talk? So sometimes you're given a really brief period, and we're, so we're uncomfortable talking about ourselves, aren't we? Sharing some of those, um, those intimate details that where we really need help. Gosh, personal care, I think about that, right? I have to talk to people about that because it's things that I need. And so you want to provide just enough details that you get your point across. You also, the way that I think about it, in fact, I published, or not published, but I um, posted some images up here of different headlines and different articles that I've been a part of. What would fit in a newspaper article? You're given maybe two quotes, right, in a newspaper article. What are you going to touch on? What is the most important thing to convey to your audience? Hopefully it's an elected official that might be able to influence the policy that's affecting you. So what I wanted to do now is I actually wanted to take a moment. We have a, we have a decent group here. 
And I want you to think about what is your personal story? How would you construct that narrative of telling about yourself? You know, starting obviously with your name, who you are, and what brings you there. But maybe just a little bit, a few sentences about what you're going through and what change you'd like to see and why they should listen to you. Okay? So what I want you to do is just think about that for a couple moments and then maybe share with the person next to you. Share. G give your best. Have you ever heard of it be your elevator pitch? Right? What's your elevator pitch? From the time that I get in that elevator, I have about, what, one minute, maybe 45 seconds of going down that elevator. How long would you have to say, hi, this is my name, this is what I'm going through, um, and this is maybe how you could help me or why it's important? Okay? So brainstorm that for a second and then maybe share with the person next to you, okay? All right. be okay. Okay, you got another 30 seconds or so. Okay, let's go ahead and let's go ahead and bring it back. So now I heard some I heard some good practicing. I heard some um, explanations. I also heard some challenges and maybe good things. So talk to me. What was difficult about that? What was difficult about sharing your story? Isn't it? Exactly. And what's important, right? If you only have that brief window. 
exactly. And what are the details you have to share in order for it to be impactful? I think about that all the time. When you're when you have that limited time period, maybe with an elected official, but you need them to pass something, you need them to vote on something, you need them to support something, what is that part that's going to stay with them? What Did anyone do anything well that you thought really worked, that you really liked? What did you think? Yeah? Short and straight to the point? It's a good thing. Did it? Were you nervous at all, or had to think through it? Yeah. Yes, and the importance of practicing, right? Of talking with those individuals around you, making sure that you feel comfortable, so that when you're given that opportunity, you take full advantage of those 45 seconds or that one minute that you have, right? Maybe it's one meeting, and be able to talk about that. Huh? Yeah. Yup. Yeah. Yeah, they might not have that same time. And you have to be that voice for other people. Right? Yeah. 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 All of a sudden you go blank. I, I, I'll tell you, Mike, I think we have all been there. I know I have. It's like I, I've done a lot of public speaking, and I get that same way, you know, where someone asks you a question, and you're like, I don't even know my name right now. Yeah, for sure. Or you can get emotional with things, right? We're going to address that. But the next thing that I wanted to talk about, so once you've really developed your personal story, you know the parts of the story that you need to bring out. One thing that I would tell you the next step is identifying the problem as well as solutions the other way. So a couple more. No worries, Vanna. We'll get there. Okay. No, you got it. <laughs> Not firing you, no. So the next step is really identifying the problem and solutions. And the reason that this is important, because I think we need to be succinct, right? We need to think about what are those problems? What are the specific things that you want addressed or that you want handled or maybe changed? Whether it's a law, whether it's a policy, whether it's a program, or something to improve, maybe a waiver, maybe a process, something like that. What are those specific things? And now once you know the problem, you also need to identify the solution. Or what are the potential things that you could do? Because I will tell you, as an elected official um, serving on the city council, a lot of people come to me with problems. Very few come to me with solutions, okay? But if you do come with a solution, that gives me a whole new perspective on things. Because maybe that's something that I can run with, I can champion, right? I would be able to implement, I would be able to troubleshoot. Because if you've thought about it and you have that lived experience, I might not know what that's like. Think about our elected officials, right? I think about, I thought about some of the important issues and problems that I'm facing. First and foremost is the short the shortage of caregivers, okay? The shortage of caregivers. Right now, for the last two years, my mom has almost exclusively provided my care because my caregiving agency cannot hire people. Can't find them. So when I'm advocating for, the, for caregivers and talking with elected officials, how many of them do you think need caregivers? Very few, right? Very few, if any. And so what I have to think about is putting themselves, putting them in my situation, explaining to them what I need caregivers for and why it's so important in my life. So what you actually see here on the screen, a, a photo is, um, it's a snapshot 
of a news article. It was actually a TV story um, with the headline, Sioux City Council member losing access to in-home care in 2020. It was an article that ran because we just were running out of people and I was going to lose my care. But what I did was I said, okay, that's the problem, right? What's the solution? So I started thinking creatively about what solutions could be so that when I have that opportunity, when I go in front of Governor Reynolds or Lieutenant Governor Gregg or any of my other elected officials, I know what I'm advocating for. And so what I would do is I would really push them and say, look, we need to make sure that we're working with our colleges, universities, anyone interested in studying healthcare, to fill these positions. They already want to study it. Why not give them a stipend? Why not give them a scholarship to provide home care? That's important. Maybe the ability to make a competitive wage. We were talking about MEPD, Medicaid for the employed, and the glass ceiling that's above us as far as wages. We need to work on those things too, but offering a solution. Why is that important? Because I'm going to pay more in taxes. What elected official doesn't want to hear, look, I really would like to make more money so I can pay you more in taxes. Give them a win, right? Some people are struggling with transportation or wait lists on waivers, things like that. What are the solutions? What are the things you can do that those elected officials can implement in order to address that problem? Next slide. This next slide talks about the importance of keeping calm. And that was one of the things I really wanted to highlight for all of you was just really, these things are, they're emotional. They're frustrating. I still lay in bed and I still cry. I still get frustrated. I still get angry by the lack of caregivers. You think I don't want to let my mom retire or spend more time with my dad instead of driving down to help take care of me? I try to do those things, but guess what? My hands are tied. But when I'm talking to elected officials, I would encourage you to go to the balcony. And what I mean by go to the balcony is I mean take a step back. Have the 30,000 foot view. Really take yourself out of those weeds and just see the big picture. What are the moving parts? What's the problem and how can you address it? When you talk like that, when you really understand who those elected officials regularly deal with, those that are complaining to them, and you give them solutions, or you say, let's think about this in the big picture, you don't get emotional about the situation, they're so much more likely to listen to you. They're so much more likely to be someone that, that wants to help you, right? I try to look at it as, look, there is a problem, but we're trying to work together to address it. I'm on your team, you're on my team. I might have that need, but you have the ability to change it. And when you start using those, that language or start having those types of conversations, then they want to be able to help you. Next slide. So after we know our story, we know we're staying calm, we know what the problem is and solutions are, I would encourage you to build a coalition around you. Work with your peers. Talk with those individuals that maybe are experiencing similar things. Talk with them and build this coalition. And the reason that that is, is because not only, it's for two reasons that I would say that it's really important to build the coalition around you. Number one is support. To know that you are not alone. Because sometimes it can feel like we're all alone, can it? It can feel like, gosh, am I the only one struggling with this? Am I the only one? Why is this happening to me? And the truth is, is that there are probably a lot of people that it's happening to. And so reaching out to those support networks, whether it's the spinal cord um, peer support network, whether it's the Iowa chapter or association um, of different things, whether it's upgrade Medicaid, we talked about that earlier, Mike and I were talking about it, or even things like ask, right? even different programs, companies, organizations that are here to help people with disabilities. And what you do is not only create a support system for yourself, but you show a proof of urgency to those elected officials. Then you're saying, look, it's not just me that has a caregiver shortage. It's these other 15 people in my community. And if I'm having a shortage of caregivers in the fourth largest city in Iowa, you can guarantee that it's happening in rural Iowa as well, right? So show that proof of urgency. Next, I would say empower those around you. Use social media. Make sure that those around you feel empowered as well to share their voice. 
okay? Because when you do that, then you build a stronger voice. You're more united behind something. And you talk to these elected officials and you have power. You feel good about what you're doing because you know you're not alone. And use social media, folks. It's a powerful tool. Sometimes it can be scary. Sometimes it can be full of misinformation. Sometimes you just want to shut it off. But at the end of the day, if you use it effectively, you can really gain momentum behind change. And so use that to amplify your story, to share your story, and to call for action. To draw attention to what you're going through. Because I can guarantee you, you're not alone. The last thing that I, I know I, I went quickly through these last ones, and I apologize. Um, I just wanted to stay on time. The last thing that I wanted to do, next slide, is talk about the importance of being patient and persevering. Being patient and persevering. Nothing will happen as quickly as it should. You remember back to that screenshot I had of that news, that news story? said I lost my care in 2020. We're in 2022. I still don't have care. They still haven't addressed the problem, and in some ways it's probably gotten worse because that article was actually done pre-COVID, right? It takes time. I've met with the governor, lieutenant governor, and other elected officials so many times, the director of Medicaid, the director of Health and Human Services, right? All of these individuals understand the problem, but also understand its complexity. And only by working with them, making sure that they're part of the solution, can we start to gain any movement, get any traction. But it does take time, and I know it can be frustrating, and I know people ultimately will lose their lives during that time. And that's horribly unfortunate. But we have to try to do the right thing for those behind us and for those after us. Next is legislation is complicated. I tell you what, if any of you tried to pass a bill, man, it is difficult. Working with different lobbyists, working with your elected officials, talking about what can change. Um, I mean, thinking about what they have passed, right? One of the things they did in the last session, two sessions ago now, was um, actually they, they, um, they pushed back the cliff effect uh, for child care, right? They increased the income threshold to be able to allow more people childcare. I told them they should do the exact same thing with benefits for people with disabilities. Push that back so there's not a cliff effect. Allow me to make a little more money, pay more in taxes, and keep using these benefits. It costs you the same. Talk about that legislation and start somewhere. That's really the last thing that I wanted to leave you with is although this can seem daunting, once you know your story, once you identify your problems and solutions, once you can remain calm when talking about it, start somewhere. Start advocating anywhere. I put up here some of the things that you can maybe participate in. League of Women Voters forums. You know, we have those in our community almost every week during session where we can talk to our elected officials, talk to them about what we're going through and what they should be able to do to help your needs, right? Maybe you attend a city council meeting. Maybe you go to a school board meeting. Gosh, I tell you what, um, we've done great things on our city council as far as inclusion um, and accessibility. We've built entire parks that are way more accessible. We've built sidewalks to shelter houses so that people like myself can access them. We have the largest Miracle League park, which is an accessible um, softball field or baseball diamond for people with disabilities, the largest one in the world in Sioux City, Iowa. You can make a difference, whether it's locally across the state or across the country, but you have to start somewhere. Maybe you attend a committee hearing or maybe you email your elected officials. Maybe you're not comfortable speaking in public. Put those words down on paper because at the end of the day, your words have power and you can truly make a difference and leave your mark on the next generation. I know I breezed through those last parts, and I apologize for that. But I thank you so much for your attention. Um, thank you so much for the opportunity. I should describe this last photo up here um, because, uh, because my little girl there is pretty adorable. So you have a photo of me um, out in an Adams Nature Preserve. So we got a whole bunch of wild grasses behind me, 
And I have a, well, then, six-month-old golden retriever sitting on my lap. Yeah, that's Betty. Betty is my pride and joy. She is a sweetheart. Um, I hope someday she can be a service dog for me, but training is expensive and difficult to find. So we're working through that process. But I tell you what, there are bright things in life, and you have to find things like that and hold on to those. And when things are dark or when you're going through a difficult situation, advocate for that change. All right. Thank you all so much. So I know we're a little bit behind. Uh, we started a little late, and I know we have a break after this. So if you have to get up right away, maybe use the restroom. I don't fault you for that. Um, but are there any questions while I at least have this microphone turned on? Anything you were wondering or questions you would have? Yes, so remember to do those evaluations. Well, hey, I really appreciate the time, your attention, um, and your willingness to be here and be advocates. So thank you all so much. Thanks.